I know most of y'all, so we can skip to the introduction parts. <laughs> I'm, I'm really honored because uh, Dr. Romy's family is here tonight. And, uh, so I'll get a chance to say hey to them. I appreciate y'all coming. So where do we start? We start with Dr. Romy. He was an education professor at the University of South Alabama. He was also an artist. He was a painter. Uh, he taught uh, art at Pia Lincoln College, got interested in how people learn. From there he went on, got his PhD, and became an education professor, but he always had that little bit of artist in him. Uh, he never lose that. And he put that, channeled that, into his work with Deciduous Azaleas. And we're going to start on page one. What are Deciduous Azaleas? Azaleas and loser leaves in the winter. There are some 16 species of deciduous azalea that are endemic to North America. There are only three other species that are endemic to anywhere else in the world. Balls, Japan, and one out in the Baltics, I can't ever remember. So why are we hybridizing? What's the big deal here? Well, if you take the mollusks and japonica, they have much larger flowers. The work that had been done hybridizing these things before crossed them with palindolaceum out of the mountains. You crossed them with occidentalia on the west coast. You made these big, beautiful, variable flowers. And you brought them down here into our heat and they absolutely melted. So Romy was trying to take what the Xberry hybrids, that's the first guys who were really credited with uh, at the turn of the century with uh, doing the hybridization work. He was trying to bring that down into to our days. So he used our Austrina, and he used our Canessens, and he used our Viscose, and several other of our, our native azaleas to try and uh, create that. Well, he got a little carried away. <laughs> and uh, he started in 1969 hybridizing, and he made over 1,045 crosses. Uh, he described well over 100,000 flowers. See that book, is it right here someplace? I'll make off of my book, I'm gonna have to hunt you down. <laughs> this is one of his stud books. There's seven of these, this size. Each page is a cross. Each cross, he describes the flower, not just the number of seedlings, but what that actual flower looked like. This is an enormous body of work. Out of this entire body of work, the man only named a hundred deciduous as eggs. Every one of them are absolutely spectacular. His work is known all through the United States, except for here, in his hometown. That's where this comes from. We started the campaign to try and raise awareness in his own hometown to give the man a refugium for his work. And we're going to talk about what that means and how that relates to mobile botanical birds in a minute. Let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> These are the two guys right there that uh, pretty much are responsible for uh, Aromi's hybrids. One on the dock on the left is Dr. Eugene Aromi. The one on the right is Dr. John Giordano. Any of you out here know Dr. G, except the obvious? <laughs> Dr. G was a human bear. He uh, was a huge hawk of a man who uh, just was a, a delight to run around. He loved plants. So he took uh, Aromi's work and he planted it out in his property off of Calliope Road and basically preserved it for 40, 50 years. And a lot of, I'd say probably 50 to 60 percent of his work, if a Roman had not given that work to Giordano, would have been lost. So I credit him for a lot of, a lot of what's been done. Click. Click, click, click. There she is, Amelia Rose. <laughs> Romy started off with, with Evergreen Azaleas, working with the Evergreens, and he did a ton of work with Evergreen Azaleas, and he came up with some absolutely beautiful things. He took them around to the nurseries and Sims and said, look what I've got. He said, those are beautiful. We have too damn many Azaleas. We don't need them. He threw it away, the entire project. He uh, fortunately had this friend named John Giordano, who uh, planted a lot of these plants out at his uh, Echo Ranch, out at his property. 
and they sat there for 40 something years. Dr. Uh, John Allen Smith, who we'll talk about in a little while, did promote uh, some of them, but there was a large body of his work that sat for a long time. We discovered it, we being Vandergeese and Nursery, in our work with deciduous azaleas. I know a little bit about evergreen azaleas. I went out to Giordano's for the first time, and I started walking around, and there's this beautiful azalea. I don't know that. There's another, another, another. About the 50th one I hit, it's like, stop. What is all this? So he told me the story. We did a series of evaluations. We brought them into the nursery. We trialed them. We grew them out. And we came up with five new azaleas. And we said, these are fabulous. This is one of them. About the time Jeanette had these five kids, <laughs> I had five names. <laughs> This is uh, probably one of the most beautiful azaleas in existence, Amelia Rose. Click. Tally. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> Just as pretty as, as uh, her flower. Click. Red Ribbons was probably one of the earliest ones that uh, he got out. It was actually listed in, in uh, one of the big azalea books of, of the time. Uh, Great American Isaiahs, and uh, I found the last existing red ribbons out of John Giordano's place. It was uh, it had been sitting in a metal can for 50 years. Tough plants. Michelle Lux. Oh, she's not here. That's right. That's the cousin. Catherine Allison. She's here. <laughs> I'm getting a huge kick out of this. <laughs> you can't really tell from the picture, but what these plants were was he was crossing the southern indicus to try and bring the height down, but to keep that, that vitality of the plants. Anybody knows who's planted azaleas in Mobile, Alabama, Kirby, Traper, Formosa, these big monsters that we plant, they're happy. You put them in the ground, they take off. A lot of the things that we plant here, the little Kurumi azaleas that we try to plant here, they fall apart. It's that heat tolerance that he was looking for, but he wanted to bring in the bloom forms and, and some variation. It succeeded magnificently. He's got a whole series of azaleas that stay low. Catherine Allison has about a three and a half inch flower. It's huge. But that's not what we came to talk about. We came to talk about the aroma garden. So click. This was the, one of the first ones uh, from the series, Romy Sunrise. We're going to take it chronologically, sort of. So I'm going to go ahead and say click. This is uh, one of the guys that was responsible for the very beginning. Dr. John Allen Smith, the maple garden right out here is named for him, had uh, a nursery in Chunchula, Alabama. He was a, a great as a collector along with Dr. Giordano. Uh, there's a a great story about them all meeting in the woods from three different directions with shovels to get the same plants. <laughs> Giordano was the biggest he ended up with. He named it Calamity Junction. <laughs> David was the uh, manager of Magnolia Nursery at the time. And John Allen came to him and said, pick me out the 10 best plants. He had, he had been collecting Hiromi's early crosses. So pick me out the 10 best plants, and they register eight of them. Romy Sunrise was one of them. We'll go through these, Pink Carousel. We've got some of those here, by the way. It's a beautiful thing. Four Kings. Like I said, this, co this talk is called Pretty Pretty Pictures. There's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. Clear Creek. These things are unique in... Uh, in southern horticulture because there's nothing like this down here. Their, their plant forms are completely different. If you think about Australia, our, our native yellow azalea, flowers about yay big, just beautiful thing. I'm not dissing it. But then you take these things and all of a sudden the flowers become five times the size. You get uh, trusses the size of softballs. We're in a different game. And they're happy as plants down here. So now we go to the, uh, the early cultivars that were released. Well, what happened? John Allen Smith had Magnolia Nursery. He was into maples. He was into magnolias. He was into this 
Castilian, he was into camellias, he was into azaleas. He had probably the finest garden I've ever seen in the southeast. But he had his fingers in everything. And these uh, azaleas were only a little piece of it. So they worked and concentrated on getting those early cultivars that we talked about, those first 10, out into the marketplace. Well, Moroni didn't stop. He kept hybridizing. And these plants basically got warehoused. So there were a whole series of cultivars that we had a name, but we never saw the plants. But you're not planting them out in his woods. Moroni had some of them in his backyard. We'll talk about his backyard later. These, uh, these are the cultivars that we collected. Out of 105 plants that were named, there were 80 that still exist. We've already lost 25 of them by the time that I started collecting. That's all I can find. There may be a few more, but basically I can say there are about 80, 80 to 85 around us now. We gathered them all together. We planted them out of the nursery, put them in the ground, put them in production, and we tried to, uh, to save them. Some of these things are incredible plants because he kept improving. As time went on, he kept working. Tipple's toy. This is uh, Tipple Alexander. She's uh, one of Jeanette's daughters. Um, this was one of them that uh, she was playing with uh, the tag that was on the seedling. And uh, of course, Aromi was like, stop. But uh, he named that one Tipple's toy. <laughs> Misty Dawn. Now, a lot of these plants, the only places that these exist are in collections. Now, why is that? Because commercial nurseries cannot handle 85 varieties of aroma. And we'll talk about what, what the, the consequences of that are. Southern Set Set, this is one of my favorites. This thing changes color every year. Oh, you can keep going a little bit. We still got a few of them. Is that high yeah. times? Back up. Okay. You're going too fast. Is there a thing called high tide? There is a high tide. Okay. It's a light with the old watch, great big uh, early one. That was one of the John Allen was selling. But you know, what a shame for something like this to disappear from the face of the earth, which is um, without botanical gardens and collections, that's exactly what would have happened. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about what that means. As, as pretty as these pictures are, they. Mm. Back up. Hey. <laughs> Is this thing going on, with, uh, on its own here? As pretty as these things are, they bear no, no resemblance whatsoever to plants. Without seeing the fragrance, without being able to see the texture, without being able to walk around these things, all you've got is a pretty, pretty picture. That's not all we need. What we need are the plants. Keep on going. I am growing this one. Isn't that beautiful? Coral reef is kind of an interesting story. That's one of them that uh, we thought was lost. And Aromi numbered his plants. And he, here's what he did. He started with A. And his first seedling that he described the flower was A1. Okay. When he got to Z, he started over again with AA. And the first sprout, the first flower was AA1, second one was AA2 from that cross. When he got to ZZ, he started over again with AAA. Okay? So this is like AHZ1. <laughs> 1,045 crosses, a lot of crosses. This is one of them that was by his number that uh, when, when uh, Dr. Rumi got, uh, got ill, uh, we started transferring the plants out to the nursery so I could take care of them. And he asked us to finish his work and to do the, the final evaluations and to look at these things and make sure that you know, the best of what his work had actually got preserved. Well, this was one of them that was AHZ1 and, and uh, I was looking at it going, man, that's incredible. What a great flower. So that's one of them that we were going to name. Then I go back to the stud books and find out he already named it. So he chose this one and I chose this one too. <laughs> he chose it first. 
Glory Be, that came from Dr. John Giordano, where uh, Romy brought a little piece of a, the flower over to him and said, what do you think of this? And Dr. G said, Glory Be. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I'm, I'm bulking up for production. I think it's going to do real well. You can't really tell that the, the trusses on this thing are the size of softballs. Soccer balls. <laughs> Amy Dennis, another one of the lost ones that uh, I found out in here, Donna. This is kind of a sad story. The parent plant for this one from Spanish Maine was in Dr. Giordano's, uh, in uh, Dr. Rumby's side yard. Uh, I'll talk about his yard. They called it the jungle. His backyard was, I guess, about half the size of this building. And it had thousands of plants. He had his irrigation set up on the fence all the way around the thing. And there wasn't any backyard. It was all his eggs, the whole thing. I don't know how he played as a kid. Maybe just threw his eggs. He waited until we were done with the swing set and then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when. Dr. Uh, 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 Romy passed away, and his wife, Jane, passed not too long after him, just a few years after him. Uh, they sold the house, and the, uh, the new occupants tore out all the plants. All the plants. He had a collection of antique uh, Southern Indica azaleas, uh, a lot of number of hybrids that I did not get cuttings on. Fortunately, I did get cuttings on this one, and it was preserved. Did they know what they were doing? Don't get me started. <laughs> I love them. You know, he had such a poetic uh, sense on these names. Uh, Dancing Rabbit, Laughing Lion, you know, Spanish Man, King's Treasure. A lot of these guys name them John Periwinkle or Edna Futz. You know. <laughs> it's hard to sell Edna Futz. Spring Fanfare is one of the largest ones. Again, that's about a six inch flower. Uh, this thing in bloom is, is really spectacular. Now, again, remember, none of these ever made it to the market. These were plants that simply existed in John Giordano's yard and in Dr. Romy's yard. Nowhere else. You're looking at one of the kinds. Click. There's Latin line. Isn't that pretty? I don't know if I like the plant or the name. Fantastic. <laughs> Tom Johnson is the uh, director of, of uh, oh yeah, I'm talking to Tom. Hey, he's right there. Oh. <laughs> uh, Tom, Tom's a, a great guy. He's the director of, of uh, Magnolia Plantation in Charleston. And he's responsible for getting the uh, Aromi garden really rolling. I was bitching about the fact that mobilians are so cheap and that we couldn't raise enough money, $20,000, to be able to put this garden in. And he made the statement, you know, we only need to get 200 people to give $100. I'll throw in $100, and he did. And we were rolling. From then on, it just kept going, and uh, Mobile did step up to the plate, and we did raise the $20,000 that we needed. Anyway, it's Tom, are you, are you from Charleston? I'm from Tennessee. Can't hear. I, I, well, okay. I just didn't know where all this was happening. This is happening on Facebook. Yeah, you rolled <laughs> your eyes, and I understand that completely. <laughs> uh, social media is a powerful, powerful thing. It connects the entire nation together in a way that was never possible to do before, with letters, visuals, dialogue, interrelated uh, people that are, are have interrelated ideas. <laughs> in this case. It raised $20,000 for an azalea garden, and almost half of that came from outside of Mobile. Uh, parts of it came from the Netherlands, uh, Sweden, uh, Oklahoma, uh, folks that uh, I never heard of were fetching in $100 for this project, because it's a great project. <laughs> Fantastic uh, got named because uh, we were doing evaluations on, on plants, and Tom brought uh, a couple of his foreign exchange students that uh, he had at the, um, the plantation over to, to visit and to see what Southern horticulture was about. And I was showing Coralie, you know, 
this plant and she says, oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a name. <laughs> and it is fantastic, yes. isn't it? The second generation of uh, plants, um, Linda Guy is responsible for those. Linda was uh, out at Magnolia Nursery. Uh, she was the manager after <coughs> David Ellis left. She worked there for years and years with John Allen. Um, she took a lot of his work up to Charleston, again, to uh, uh, Carolina Nursery, which was owned by Jay Guy at the time. And they were doing evaluations, but they had the same sort of issues that John Allen had, which is that it's a huge nursery. They had their fingers and everything. It was one of the most incredible plant lists I've ever seen in any nursery in the country. But she did do some of those loss releases. She did manage to get some of those into the marketplace. And that's where these come from, Spring Fandango. And you know, if she shared these with me or they would still be around. There's one of Carolina Nursery's tags on that one. I love this one. We actually put this in uh, in uh, tissue culture. Dim the lights a little bit. Mm -hmm. These colors look a little washed out to me. Do I know how to do that? Yes. So that's going to make me look better on the film. <coughs> <laughs> Less of me you see, the better. See how that has that single yellow petal? It does that every year. It's, it's a bright, bright orange with one single yellow petal. And again, these are for large, large flowers. That was one of Linda's out of Carolina. How long do the blooms last? You know, it's, and it's, it's an extended season. People talk about azaleas, gosh, they just don't bloom very long. Satsuki azaleas in uh, Mungo Botanical Gardens are just now really hitting their stride. Uh, it depends upon which which plant you take. These are aromatics, they're still they're in bloom right now. So it starts somewhere around the uh, second week of March and it'll bloom all the way up to June. It just depends on which cultivar that you pick. Touch pink, I brought some of these. That's a, a lovely thing. It has a strong yellow blot with that uh, gentle, gentle yellow. And King's Wizard, I think that's all of the ones that they introduced. <laughs> Cold fire's named after 2000. I think that's about right. I think that's that's the time that we uh, we finally uh, got in. What happened was Linda was up in Charleston, and Dr. G and and Aromi needed somebody locally to to cooperate with. I went over to his house and he showed showed me slides, and I have probably the same reaction you guys were having. The first time you see these things, it's like Holy moly, what is this? So he started bringing plants over to us and we started taking these things and planting them out. This is our, uh, uh, the beginning of our little test area. This was taken somewhere around Katrina. See that oak tree that uh, fell in the middle of it and killed about 10 plants? Uh, these are cultivars. A lot of them, uh, uh, Rummy never saw flowers. Spring sensation we did is probably one of the most floriferous of uh, the aromatic cultivars. It'll actually bloom as a liner, which is a little cutting. Uh, you know, you get this little thing with this great big bloom on it. It's crazy. Fat Ryan, anybody ever heard that name before? Yeah. <laughs> I had to name one for Pat. Uh, of course, he was. Instrumental in, in uh, this place getting off the ground, as, as well as all the work that he did out of Allograph Gardens. And he uh, helped uh, establish one of the first uh, Zay chapters down here. So. Ever heard that name before? There he is, Julius Kingsley. <laughs> and a good, strong plan it is. Kevin Patrick? That was my brother. That's your brother. Okay. <laughs> he passed away, so I made more. I didn't know. Oh. He was between you know, me I and I did know that. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So that was Daddy's son. Okay. Okay. I love having him here. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Patrick's a beautiful thing. That was one of them that uh, I got lucky on. I lost the plant. Uh, I only had one. Uh, and I had taken a couple cuttings off of it, and I sent it back up to Linda Guy up at uh, uh, Carolina Nursery. And uh, I lost the plant, and she sent one back to me. So there again, and we're getting into this botanical garden thing. Why do we do this? Melvin Giordano was John Giordano's wife, uh, just a gentle, wonderful woman. She was always just real sweet to me. I, I haven't spoken to her in years and years. I'm, I'm not even sure where she is anymore. But uh, we named this one for her last year. This is one of the last two plants that uh, uh, Dr. Romy named. There are three, James Thompson, Peter Vanderbeesen, and Linda Guy. And he, he named those on his deathbed. And it was literally the, the day before he passed away, the night before he passed away. We were still talking about his eggs. <laughs> he was passionate. Jeanette Ann. There she is. <laughs> This one is out of Dr. Giordano's place. We were driving by, and of course, he drives like a bat out of hell on those little uh, dirt roads. And he's flying down the road, and I'm holding on. I see this thing off in the woods, and I'm like, stop, stop. Boom, I hit the windshield. I said, what? He said, what's that? He said, oh, I just went to So I got out and jumped out because I didn't want to argue with him. And I uh, pulled one back and brought it in, and again, the same, oh, oh Lord, dude. <laughs> that, uh, that's where that one came from. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit. Did I put that in there twice? I guess I did. Whoops. I, no, I did it. Sorry. You just like it. Yeah. Mike Stump, terrible name um, for a plant. You don't want to call anything a stump. <laughs> <laughs> this came from Barbara Stump. Uh, Mike passed away a couple of years ago. Barbara Stump. <laughs> is where I got most of the design ideas for our rhododendron garden. The, the council ring, that whole circle thing with the benches, the, the little <coughs> stations, they have got a stunning azalea garden in Nacogdoches, Texas. If you ever get a chance to see it, it's a wonderland. It's about five times the size of this garden right here. Um, Barb's been a close friend for years, and, and when uh, when her husband passed away, I named this one for, uh, for Mike because uh, she was so instrumental in the development of, of this garden. Now, we're going to talk about what doesn't exist anymore, lost cultivars. We've lost of the, the hundreds of thousands of plants that this man grew out and described. He only named a little over 100. We, all, we lost almost a quarter of them just in the time that we're within this man's lifetime. This is where the importance of Mobile Botanical Gardens comes from. It allows us to do things that commercially or privately cannot be done. Let's say you want to collect the aromas. What happens when you're gone? I'll tell you what happens when you're gone. It disappears, just like aromas yard disappears. No individual can collect and plan to keep these things. We only have one life. It's not long enough. Botanical Gardens gives us an opportunity to have, keep, and pass on to future generations. There are a lot of the evergreen azaleas that we discussed earlier that exist nowhere else except for Mobile Botanical Gardens right now. We are the collection for Dr. Aromi's evergreen azaleas. Now we're going to be one of the most important collections for uh, his deciduous azaleas because we're not just going to be putting the name ones in there. I'm going to be putting the, my number ones in there too. We're going to put basically everything that I've got in there because if I fall down, I don't want to have anything bulldozed. This is gone. Click. Gone. 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 Well, that ain't Thank you for not letting that happen here. Hybrid development. Well, 
So I'm going to talk briefly about this. I know you guys aren't nerve for people, but it's still kind of fascinating. This is ADX4. It's the first time I saw it bloom in 2004. And this is what you start with. You got a whole group of seedlings you look at and you go, hmm, that looks kind of interesting. So you can kind of take that when you pull it to the side. In 2006, like five, well, he started looking a lot more interesting. In 2006, well, he's getting genuinely glorious at that point. If you made a good choice, it starts showing. And then two years after that, boom, you end up with something that's fantastic. HF1, this is another one that started with a, a single orange red flower. And uh, I'm going to name this one this year. Uh, it is going to be named, drum roll, click. I'm Dodd Jr. Oh. It's uh, stunning. Again, the, the photographs, pretty, pretty pictures. Thank God we've got more than pretty, pretty pictures to look at here. These are some things that we're still looking at that are seedlings that uh, this one mystifies me. You see this down here? This little yellow? That's the same plant. Let's look at the next picture. It's the reversal of it. That's the same plant, and there's your darker flower down there. They also they shift a little bit from year to year, depending on what the, weather, what the weather is. This one shifts a lot. It kind of settled on the next slide, but now it's, it's more or less kind of turned into that, which is, I'm okay with that. We've got probably, we've collected well over a thousand seedlings from Dr. Aromi's uh, yard. Uh, I would say a good two thirds of those he never saw flower. Uh, most of them were last crosses. He was making crosses the year that he died. Uh, a lot of those he never had the opportunity to see flower. Out of those thousand, it's taken me about 15 years to, to go through them and we're just finishing it up at this point. Just getting down to the end of it. To where I think I've seen everything. AHV15, think that's a, that needs a name? How about that? Does that need a name? I've seen uglier things than names. There's always something, always something out there to move inside. But, you know, we need to be able to, to look back and to, to preserve our history. These great hybridizers need some place that we could pass this on to future generations and to say, this was ours. Dr. Rumley was one of us. And on behalf of Dr. Giordano and Dr. Rumley, thank you. Rhododendrons that we're looking at here on the sides. Um, this is Jin Jubilee. It's the only, one of the only ones that was not chosen for the flower, it was chosen for the fragrance. It's very much like uh, our Viscosum or Seralea. And the flower the flowers are a little bit bigger and they're a little more prolific than you see on, on uh, Seralea. The fragrance will just flat knock you down. Uh, and he chose that one in that direction. This is Summer Snowball which is another one of the Viscosum crosses, which is why they're blooming now. Uh, this one, you can't really see it from this plant. I'm sorry I didn't have a better example, but I've sold them all. Uh, this one it does the same sort of thing, except for it has ball trusses on it. Fragrance isn't quite as strong as this, but I've never seen anything with fragrance as strong as this. But it has those large white balls and flowers in the sun. Uh, these other ones, I think, are things that will marketplace that a few of them touch a pink and a few others that uh, were left over for the spring plant sale and I think we're we're selling those if uh, if anybody's interested in picking those up. Yes. And of course in the fall plant sale we'll, we'll have a pretty good uh, selection of uh, uh, aromas. Also we're going to try and, and get a good selection of uh, the Confederate series but that's a that's another story. The uh, how do they handle the sunlight? Is it a full sun, hard sun? These are all understory plants. If you see them in the woods, they typically are on creek banks. Um, 
rarely see them out in, in the open, although occasionally you do. And something like this where you've got these long leaf pines and you've got uh, dappled shade, if you can protect them from the afternoon sun in Mobile, Alabama, they'll do fine. Uh, if you've got morning sun, that's fine. If you got up to noon, that's fine. They get a little scorched if uh, they're just like us. You stand out there, the same thing happened to you. Oh, I understand. I understand. Pardon, but how long do That varies, but not as much as you would think. I really like to think of these as small trees. Uh, you, know, it's, you don't want to take these things and try and prune them down into little poon bushes. That's not what they are. These are our large base shapes. Some of them we have ADX is 15 feet. Um, it's a monster, but typically you see these things seven to eight feet, and that's about where you want it. Seven to eight feet. You know, pruning wise, it, yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. I've got uh, my plants on six foot spacings, and uh, that seems to be the, the magic number. Uh, you know, if you, if you wanted to put them in the landscape, I'd say put two or three together and let them come up and then give them about six feet around and use them as accents. Now they are deciduous, so they're gonna be what? They're gonna be trees. They're gonna look like naked trees in the winter. So, you know, putting them all across your front yard, maybe not the best idea in the entire world. But uh, as a background or as a, as a specimen plant, that's what they're for. Use them like you use a small tree. Any more questions? Anybody else? So, so I, you know, you know, my house is the front yard faces north, so it's a challenge to get anything to grow there in the, in the early spring. Mm -hmm. But the, I mean, the backyard faces south. It sounds like that would be a pretty good uh, place for it. Um, Tony Amat said it best. I never know a plant until I killed it three times. <laughs> or does it? Or does the? I mean the. <laughs> The, the winter sun is all in the south. Yeah, it's that's exactly right. You know, you don't have to worry about them in the winter. They're asleep. Yeah, you yeah. can do anything you want. They're, they're, they're fine. Uh, as, as long as they've got some protection against the western sun, you're okay. Yeah. You can come on in here. <laughs> Equity screen. Okay, Martin, <laughs> could you do me a favor? We've heard the name. Would you introduce them? Oh, yes. Cool. Uh, I'm only genetic. Of the light of the I only know by the flowers. <laughs> this is uh, this is Dr. Rome, uh, Dr. Uh, Rome. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Romy's uh, grandchildren uh, and daughters. And, and I'll let the, his daughter Jeanette introduce them. This is should I do them in order? Uh, whatever you want to do. Okay. Uh, my oldest daughter, who's not here, Temple Alexandra, um, was the first. And then Catherine um, is Marilyn, my sister's um, oldest daughter. And then um, her son, Ethan, was the next grandchild, and he's at the cross practice. Um, and then um, Jacob. And uh, then we had our little population explosion. We had <laughs> quintuplets. So we had oh, Hallie God. and Sophie and uh, Shipley, Isabella, and Amelia Rose. And then the last grandchild is Julius. <laughs> Thank you guys so much.